This afternoon, I'm honored to introduce Paul Josco, Professor of Economics and Management at MIT. He graduated from Cornell University with a BA in Economics in 1968, and in 1972, he earned a PhD in Economics from Yale University. He has served as a distinguished faculty member at MIT since 1972. Since 1999, he has served as director of the MIT Center for Energy and Environmental Policy Research. On January 1, 2008, he will become president of the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. During his 35-year academic career, Professor Josco has published six books and over 125 scholarly papers on industrial organization, energy and environmental economics, and government regulation. This scholarship examines the major economic issues facing the energy industry during this period. Early in his academic career, Professor Josco studied regulation of electric utility rates. These papers examine regulators' efforts to protect consumers from the monopoly pricing power of utilities while providing a reliable service. With the energy shortage in the last half of the 1970s, he expanded his research to include energy efficiency, the future of nuclear power, and utilities' long-term fuel contracts. Since 1991, he has studied the effects of restructuring the electric utilities, strategies to reduce energy consumption and air pollution, and a reexamination of nuclear energy. His 1998 papers on sulfur dioxide trading demonstrate the efficiency and effectiveness in using market-based approaches to controlling air pollution. His most recent research examines strategies to control global warming. In addition to his activities as a scholar, Paul Josco has also exercised leadership in the business and public sectors. He is a member of the Board of Overseers of the Boston Symphony Orchestra. He has served on the boards of directors of several energy companies in the policy arena Paul Josco has served on the EPA's Acid Rain Advisory Committee and the Environmental Economics Committee of the EPA Science Advisory Board. During his 35-year academic career, Professor Josco has been honored with numerous awards. I will name a few of the most recent awards here. In 2004, the International Society for Energy Economics honored him with the Outstanding Contributions to the Profession Award. In 2007, the Industrial Organization Society named him to the Distinguished Fellow Award. In 1982 and 2002, his students recognized him with the Graduate Teaching Award and Undergraduate Teaching Award, respectively. Clearly, Professor Josco uses his academic and leadership skills to promote workable solutions for our environmental and energy challenges. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, nice introduction and thank you all for being here uh, and thank you for letting me to participate in what's been a, a very interesting uh, set of lectures and, and also very enjoyable uh, entertainment. Uh, I changed the, the title of my talk slightly. Uh, I, I'm the economist here and uh, I, expect, I suppose many of you expect me to say that uh, well, everything's really too expensive, and uh, uh, we ought to wait and see what happens, and uh, uh, this is all pie in the sky. But, uh, but I, uh, I'm not. Uh, uh, what I want to focus on uh, are public policy 
options, in particular uh, the importance of placing a price on uh, CO2 emissions uh, in order to stimulate uh, some of the behavior and the new technologies that we've discussed uh, uh, in the past day and a half. Uh, I believe that there are many people who are altruistic. Uh, there are even corporations uh, which are altruistic. Uh, however, I often also believe that uh, uh, in general, uh, both for corporations and for many individuals, uh, it's important uh, to make behavior that we would like them to engage in uh, to be in their own self-interest. Uh, uh, and that's going to be the focus of uh, uh, my policy proposals. Uh, I thought of uh, uh, giving the, the talk a slightly different name, and I'll tell you what it is. Uh, it's called The Rat Needs to Smell the Cheese. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, how we create the smell and try to get the rat to, to smell it. Uh, I'd like to start, uh, first of all, by uh, making it clear that uh, all economists uh, uh, aren't uh, bad people uh, who don't believe in things. Uh, uh, I want to start with reference to the Stern Review uh, that was completed last year. Uh, the Stern Review uh, was commissioned by the British government uh, nearly three years ago. Uh, the uh, leader of the review was Sir Nicholas Stern, a very distinguished British economist uh, who I've known for many years. Uh, and uh, uh, the focus of the review was on the economic consequences of climate change, uh, although it ended up covering uh, many, many things. Uh, and I agree with uh, many of the conclusions in that review, uh, maybe not in every single detail, but certainly in the major thrust. So let me just go through what I see as the, uh, as the major uh, as the major conclusions for us to uh, focus on. Uh, first of all, there's overwhelming scientific support to conclude that the Earth's climate is rapidly changing due to human activity resulting in emissions of greenhouse gases. Uh, we've heard about that uh, today. We heard about it yesterday. Uh, under business as usual, and I'm going to come back and talk a little bit more about what this mysterious business as usual really means. Uh, under business as usual, average global temperatures will rise by 2 to 5 degrees by 2030 to 2060 by mid-century. Uh, at current levels of emissions, global temperatures will rise by 3 degrees to 10 degrees by 2100. I'm giving wide ranges here. I'll come back and talk about that as well. Uh, and as the Earth warms, abrupt large-scale changes in the climate are possible with serious economic uh, and social consequences. Uh, the potential adverse economic and social consequences of climate change are large compared to the costs of mitigation. Uh, the, the costs of mitigation are going to be uncertain. Uh, the potential costs and consequences of climate change are uncertain. Uh, but I'll argue, uh, looking at this properly, uh, the benefits uh, of beginning to do something now, something significant, uh, are likely to far outweigh the cost. Uh, climate change is thus an urgent and serious issue requiring a global response to a global commons problem, or what economists call an externality problem. Uh, the longer we wait, and the higher will be the costs of climate change, as well as the costs of mitigating greenhouse gases to sa stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. Uh, there are differing views at, at what we should aim at. Uh, uh, Dr. Hansen this morning spoke about aiming at uh, uh, 450 parts per million of CO2 equivalent. Uh, I'll discuss the difference. Uh, the Stern Review says that uh, aiming at 550 parts per million by 2050 is a practical, and when I use the term practical, I mean economically practical, uh, p politically practical, uh, and technically feasible, and those are not all the same thing, uh, and perhaps a prudent goal. Uh, I think I saw Nick Stern on Friday, and I think he would say that 550, uh, given developments and in information uh, about changes in the climate, is probably pretty risky. But we'll see. It's uh, a challenge even to, to meet 550 uh, by two of them. But that uh, some of the potential for future mitigation are things that we, we don't really know about yet, uh, or which we know about with great uh, uncertainty. Uh, and providing a framework in which new ideas can be developed and applied uh, is very important. 
Uh, the Stern Review also concludes that carbon taxes or, or cap and trade mechanisms that place a price uh, on greenhouse gas emissions should be the primary policy instrument. And I'll explain why in a little, in a little while. It's not the only policy instrument. Uh, there are also opportunities for using uh, energy efficiency standards, uh, labeling requirements, uh, and other mechanisms to provide information uh, and uh, obligations on individuals and corporations to deal with other types of market imperfections that go beyond the narrow commons and externality problem which we associate with uh, climate change. We also need dramatic increases in R&D support, and there's been very little mention of that so far uh, uh, in these sessions. Uh, government R&D throughout the developed countries has declined dramatically since the early 1980s. Uh, we do need new technologies, and we need better technologies, and we, ne we need more options to choose from. Uh, and the issue here is how to provide the incentives to get not only governments but uh, private firms uh, to invest in research and development uh, in new technologies. Uh, and finally, we have a global problem. Uh, this is not just a U.S. problem. It's not just a European problem. Uh, it's a global problem. We need to find some way of engaging uh, China, India, and other developing countries in solutions to this problem, recognizing that we have different levels of standard of living uh, and also that we've made differing contributions historically uh, to the current concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, very quickly, just to provide some background, as we learned this morning, there are, uh, are many different greenhouse gases. They have different physical attributes uh, in terms of their forcing capabilities. Uh, uh, the, the US, uh, uh, has U.S. greenhouse gas emissions uh, of carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and, uh, and others have been increasing slowly since 1990 uh, by about a percent a year. Uh, I think you may read in the newspaper soon, if you have not already, that the increase in CO2 emissions in 2006 uh, was either zero or perhaps slightly negative. Uh, I think one of the reasons for that is the high energy prices we had uh, and the uh, conservation that, uh, that resulted. But nevertheless, historically, uh, our greenhouse gas emissions have been growing slowly but steadily uh, over the past decades. Uh, while there are a number of different gases, carbon dioxide is the most important. Uh, it's something like 85 percent of the greenhouse gases we produce. Uh, and if we look at carbon dioxide sources, uh, fo combustion of fossil fuels is by far the most important source of CO2. Uh, and that's why we've mixed together and put together uh, uh, in, these, in these discussions uh, energy policy uh, and CO2 policy. They go together because energy combustion, uh, uh, combustion of fossil fuels is such an important contributor uh, to U.S. CO2 emissions. Uh, if we turn to the energy sector itself, the two most important sources of CO2 emissions are the electric power sector here. Uh, and you can see at, that uh, much of the CO2 emitted by the electric power sector is coal, uh, coal combustion. While coal accounts for only about 50 percent of the electricity we produce in the U.S., uh, it accounts for a, a very large fraction uh, of the CO2 emissions. The second sector uh, is transportation, uh, and the transportation sector uh, has another important feature. We haven't talked much about uh, energy security, in particular the dependence of the U.S. on uh, imports of, of petroleum from unstable parts of the world, but you can see there's a big difference between uh, the transportation sector and the electric power sector. The electric power sector, we use almost no oil. Uh, in the transportation sector, we use about 67 percent of the oil consumed in the U.S., and that's forecast to rise over the next 20 years uh, to over 75 percent. So things we do in the transportation sector to reduce consumption of petroleum are a twofer. Uh, we get benefits in terms of climate change. Uh, we also can get benefits in terms of energy security. Uh, so these two sectors have some different attributes to them from that perspective. Uh, as we look forward under business as usual, uh, future emissions in the United States are forecast to continue to grow uh, from about 6 billion tons a year of CO2 uh, today to about 8 billion tons a year uh, of CO2 uh, in 2030. Now let me say something about business as usual. What does that mean? 
Business as usual doesn't mean that we do nothing. Uh, these are forecasts from the Energy, Energy Information Administration uh, of the Department of Energy, and they incorporate current policies, uh, including the, the policies that were adopted in the 2005 Energy Policy Act. They also try to reflect known and likely technological changes on both the supply sides uh, and the demand sides. Uh, but nevertheless, as we look going forward at the U.S., uh, uh, not only are we not stabilizing our CO2 emissions or reducing them, but they're continuing to grow rather significantly despite some major uh, efforts in the Energy Policy Act of 2005 uh, and at the state level uh, to try to affect uh, these historical trends. And it's not that Americans are becoming as individual, more gluttonous users of energy uh, and, 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 and emitting more CO2. Actually, emissions of CO2 per capita in the U.S. have been declining slightly uh, since 1990 and have been roughly constant since the, uh, since the early 1970s. And emissions per dollar of GDP have been, uh, have been declining. Uh, however, the population continues to rise. Uh, and as the population rises, we have more people uh, who are consuming energy so that our, uh, our consumption of energy and our emission of uh, greenhouse gases continues to increase despite the fact uh, that there in fact have been some major increases in energy efficiency. Uh, if we look back historically, this, this chart shows uh, uh, energy consumption per dollar of GDP. These are historical data. These are EIA's forecast data. Uh, here are historical data uh, for energy consumption per capita. Uh, energy consumption per capita has been about constant uh, going back to the 1970s. Actually, for a period of time, it declined when prices were very high. Uh, and energy use per dollar of GDP has been declining. And it's not all that the structure of the economy has changed. About three quarters of the improvement in energy use per dollar of GDP is associated with energy efficiency. Uh, the typical home today is much larger than it was 20 years ago. It has many more appliances. Uh, it has personal computers. Uh, it has flat screen TVs. Uh, but the energy use in the typical home uh, has not increased because of improvements in energy efficiency. So it's not a question of having done nothing on energy efficiency. Uh, to reverse the trends in overall consumption of energy, which continue to go up, uh, uh, we're going to have to do uh, much better on this and other fronts. So looking forward, the reason uh, carbon dioxide emissions are forecast to grow uh, is energy consumption is forecast to grow. So liquids are, are uh, uh, gasoline, uh, heating oil, uh, both conventional uh, gasoline, but also gasoline produced uh, from uh, imports of uh, uh, heavy oil uh, that are refined into gasoline. Uh, you'll notice here that, that coal production increases and then actually increases even faster later in the period. And we heard this morning coal is bad from a CO2 perspective. Well, under business as usual, what happens in, in this particular model uh, is we don't run out of natural gas uh, or petroleum, uh, but the prices go up uh, rather dramatically towards the, en the end of this period. Uh, and generating electricity from coal becomes relatively more economical and more profitable uh, as time goes on. And then down here, you can see the non-carbon generating sources of energy, like nuclear power, which I'll talk a little bit about, uh, non-hydro renewable energy resources, uh, uh, and hydroelectric power are forecast to grow, but to grow very, very slowly this period of, during this period of time. So over the next 25 years, uh, under business as usual, the economy, uh, as an energy, from an energy perspective, is primarily uh, a fossil fuel economy. Uh, if we now go to the uh, to the world, and I won't spend much time on this, the, uh, the U.S., as we've heard, is a uh, major producer of CO2. Uh, 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 our CO2 production is, gro is, is growing at about 1% 1, 1 per year under business as usual. Uh, but other countries are also major producers uh, in the European Union. Uh, and most recently, although not historically, uh, China has become a major producer of CO2. Uh, and India, while not quite as large as China, uh, is likely to become a major producer of CO2. It doesn't matter where the CO2 is produced, whether it's in the United States or Canada or France uh, or Russia or China 
Uh, it goes up into the atmosphere, it eventually gets mixed together uh, and contributes to global warming. And you can see that uh, this is primarily a, a post-industrial revolution problem uh, where human beings have uh, uh, emitted large amounts of CO2 into the atmosphere. And from a policy perspective, as I'll discuss in more detail, getting so many countries together to solve a challenging problem that involves both costs and benefits uh, uh, is, a, uh, is a major uh, international diplomatic and domestic political uh, challenge. And if we go to the world, there are business as usual forecasts for the whole world as well, uh, and these are business as usual forecasts that also incorporate uh, the Kyoto Protocol, at least up until 2012, when it, uh, uh, as it's now structured, runs out, uh, actions in the European Union and others. And again, the story is not very bright. Uh, continuing emissions of carbon dioxide, coal continuing to grow in use no matter how bad it is from a CO2 perspective, from an economic perspective, it's relatively cheap, uh, and continued but slow increases in use uh, of liquids uh, from both conventional sources uh, and non-conventional sources like uh, the tar sands in Alberta. And let me note, I, I visited the tar sands last year and I took a tour. Uh, they're producing a lot of stuff up there. It's booming. Uh, at $80 a barrel of oil, uh, a lot of that production is uh, economical without a charge on CO2 emissions because it produces uh, a lot of CO2 along with the production of, uh, uh, of petroleum. Uh, the developing countries will eventually overtake the developed countries in terms of their uh, CO2 production potential, whether it will be 2015 or 2010 or 25. 2025 depends on uncertain assumptions about, uh, about rates of economic growth, uh, but it's fairly clear that the trends are in this direction. Uh, and as I'll show you in a moment, this is a problem that developed countries can't deal with uh, on their own. Uh, let me say something about uh, uh, climate change models. I'll, I'll be beating up on economic models in a moment. I, I don't want to beat up on them. This is from the Stern Review, uh, and it's a summary of uh, the, some of the results of climate change models that uh, were available to them at the time this was published. It was uh, just before the IPCC's uh, latest reports came out, but uh, that's not really all that relevant for, for my purposes. You see along this axis uh, different uh, uh, equilibrium concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, this is the 450 uh, that Professor Hansen talked about. Uh, I'm going to probably focus on 550 in my talk. And you can look across, and, and this gives you the range of estimates of what the effects on global temperatures will be in equilibrium uh, at different levels of uh, uh, carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. And the one thing that should strike you as you look across the page is that there's a lot of uncertainty uh, about what the f effects will be. Uh, and I think this, is, uh, this uncertainty is sort of a necessary consequence of the imperfections in these models. As we get all better information, the uncertainty bands are, uh, are, are narrowing. Uh, some people look at this and say, well, why don't you come back and talk to me after you get the uncertainty band down? Uh, I don't think that's the right way to, to think about these data. The right way to think about this is we are, are always going to be uncertain until we know what the consequences are, and by the time we know what the consequences are, it's going to be too late to do anything about them. What we should be focusing on is the upper tail, the, the bad consequences, because the bad consequences have really bad results, bad economic consequences uh, for uh, uh, economic well-being, uh, and social well-being on Earth. And I think the way I think about, about developing policies in this area is as an insurance policy, as a way of trying to ensure that if it turns out from a climate change perspective that the worst happens, uh, we, will ha and we will have taken actions to ensure that will not occur. And if it turns out that the Earth only increases in temperature by, I put only in quotations, by one or two degrees, uh, the amount of money we will have spent uh, will not be greater than the, 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 the associated benefits. Uh, we've talked about the kinds of effects that can happen, and the, uh, the thing I want to emphasize is uh, the potential impacts, economic impacts and, uh, and social impacts are, are, are nonlinear. Uh, uh, if you get 
large increases in, uh, in global temperatures, if you go from three to four, uh, the effects are much, much worse than going from zero to one or going from one to two. Uh, and uh, exactly how much they cost and exactly what they are, uh, even the best economists can't tell you. What they can tell you is there is a possibility for catastrophic events that could be extremely costly to the world economies. So having looked at all of this, uh, uh, the, the Stern Review uh, develops that, as always, this is business as usual if we do nothing, uh, and global emissions just continue to rise forever. And here are two alternative mitigation paths, a path that stabilizes at 550, uh, which is the path that uh, Dr. Hansen discussed this morning, uh, and a path for emissions that stabilizes uh, at 550. And at this point, there are, are two or three things I'd ask you to note about these stabilization paths, which we might take as goals. Uh, one is, by the middle of the century, on either path, our emissions are dramatically below what they would be under business as usual. Uh, but more importantly, by 2050, under both paths, uh, our emissions are below what they are today. Uh, and. Uh, uh, merely stabilizing emissions at current levels on a global basis uh, is uh, uh, not going to get on either of these paths. Uh, in addition, the 450 path, I would say, is extremely challenging. Uh, it requires global CO2 emissions to peak at 2010 uh, and then to decline. Uh, I just don't think that's going to happen from a political and economic perspective at least from my perspective at this point, uh, I'm focusing on seeing if we can develop policies that will at least get us to uh, concentration levels of 550 parts per million. Uh, if it's possible to, to do better, so much the better. Uh, but as of now, uh, we're not doing nearly that well. So how do we do it? Well, there aren't that many things that we know of. You can, you can, you can get uh, individuals and, and, and corporations that, that produce CO2 to to do. We can reduce the rate of demand for energy by promoting energy efficiency uh, without significantly reducing economic growth. We can do it in end use, in vehicles, uh, in appliances, in, uh, in, in, housing, in, in housing stock attributes. We can do it in the production of various commodities, uh, in the production of electricity, uh, using more efficient power plants. We can substitute low car carbon for high carbon fuels and electricity generation. Uh, and in other industrial sectors, that could be nuclear power for coal, uh, wind for fossil fuels generation, and biofuels for gasoline. We've heard about some of those already. Uh, and finally, we can continue to burn fossil fuels, but if we do that, we have to capture and then store the CO2 pretty much for good uh, somewhere uh, underground uh, and uh, uh, in the process of, uh, of uh, for example, uh, creating uh, synthetic gas uh, and sequestering the carbon uh, that uh, is stripped out of it uh, using hydrogen-rich synthetic gas that produces very little uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, how does the Stern Review uh, meet a 550 parts per million uh, mitigation scenario? I'm going to use this to try to demonstrate what a challenge this actually is. Uh, I'm not going to focus on land use. Let me just focus on energy because that's what this conference is about. Uh, he anticipates needing an energy saving uh, of about 70 percent from business as usual levels. Uh, that's a big reduction. Uh, a significant fraction of that comes from energy efficiency, uh, but also a big fraction comes from uh, supply technology. Uh, I'm not sure when he issued the report, he Nick ever looked carefully at this pie chart, but it comes from the Stern Review, and it's, it, it shows a portfolio of strategies consistent with uh, meeting a 550 parts per million target by 2050. Uh, here's energy efficiency. Uh, this is uh, increases in use of combined heat and power, what we call cogeneration in the United States. We can add them together and call them both uh, together uh, improvements in energy efficiency. Uh, that's uh, less than a quarter of the, uh, of, excuse me, that's where is combined heat and power? That's over here. Uh, energy efficiency, solar, uh, wind, uh, biofuels, uh, they're all in there. There are two we haven't talked too much about that I, I just want to emphasize to indicate why this is a real challenge. Uh, 
their model has a lot of uh, carbon capture and sequestration. So it continues to use coal, but it, it, it takes out the CO2 in some way and it stores it. Uh, it also has quite a bit of nuclear power. And just to give you a sense for the, the magnitudes involved here, for those two, this is the scale. That little pie is 1,200 new 1,000 megawatt nuclear power plants, and that's compared to the equivalent of three 1, 300 1,000 nucle megawatt nuclear power plants operating in the world today. Do you think that's going to happen between now and 2050? It could, it's conceivable, uh, but it would require uh, countries adopting policies that were favorable towards developing new nuclear power plants. As, as someone indicated, uh, no new nuclear power plant has been planned in the U.S. Uh, uh, since the late 1970s, and the last one completed uh, was in 1990, 1996. There's one nuclear power plant under construction in Europe, in France. Carbon capture and sequestration, from my perspective, is uh, even more interesting. At least I know how to build and make a nuclear power plant that works. Uh, carbon capture and sequestration of that, of that magnitude on a global basis is the equivalent of building 3,400, 500 megawatt coal plants that have carbon capture and sequestration technology associated with them. And that should be compared to uh, 500, 500 megawatt coal plants that are actually operating in the U.S. today. Uh, and coal is a major source. So that would be a, a, an increase uh, in the number of plants on a global basis of a factor of about seven with a technology which we know relatively little about at large scale. Uh, this experience with enhanced oil recovery is interesting, it's suggestive, uh, but it doesn't reflect the magnitude of the challenge that, uh, that we have in front of us here. Uh, how much CO2 is involved? It's eight billion tons per year compared to almost zero today, and if you don't think in terms of tons of, uh, of CO2 getting sequestered, uh, if you compress the liquid CO2 volume, it would be the equivalent of 140 million barrels of crude oil per day, uh, and the entire world now produces 80, 85 million barrels of crude oil per day. So at the very least, you have to admit we have a major infrastructure problem that has to be addressed here uh, if we're going to be able to rely uh, 50 or 60 years from now on significant carbon capture and, uh, and sequestration. Uh, and this is a, a, an area where substantial R&D and demonstration is, is desperately lead, needed now to see if this is really going to be an available option. I mentioned this morning the, in the Q&A the studies we've done at MIT when we, we ask people little questions about carbon capture and sequestration, like how would you like to have it stored near your house? the answer you get is exactly the same as if you ask them, how would you like a nuclear waste dump near your house? So uh, a lot of education is going to be uh, required here if that's going to be a viable option. If nuclear and carbon capture and sequestration are not viable options, the, the, the challenge of meeting uh, 550 uh, and the cost of doing so uh, are going to be much higher uh, than would otherwise be the case. Okay, the Stern Review also publishes costs. I won't go into these. Uh, uh, I want to refer you maybe to the, uh, to the vertical axis. This is the cost per ton of CO2 removed. Uh, they have the prices starting high and going low to reflect learning effects, but uh, the price to keep in, my, in your mind is over the period of the next 50 years, roughly an average price of $50 per ton of CO2 or more. And we come back and we'll talk about some of the federal energy legislation. We'll, we'll see uh, how that compares. There's also substantial uncertainty, as you can see, especially going out uh, on, on what the costs will actually be. Uh, but Nick would argue that these costs are relatively small, on the order of 1%, I would say probably closer to 1.5% or 2%, compared to the catastrophic consequences of, uh, of business as usual and the dramatic costs that would affect the economy uh, that could be as high as 15% of GDP per year. Uh, another challenge is uh, that uh, the effects uh, of, of climate change are not going to be realized for some period of time. Uh, so here's just a scatter diagram uh, that has a range of estimates of what the consequences uh, of business and usual might be going out 100 and 200 years. Uh, well, 200 years from now, you're talking about potentially very, very major uh, uh, economic uh, effects uh, on, on most countries on, on in the world uh, if the worst outcomes happen. 
uh, and fairly significant economic effects if even the best outcomes happen. The challenge from a public policy perspective, and even from an economic analysis perspective, is we've got to spend the money now, in this century, in the first half of this century, but the benefits are largely going to be realized in the next century and the century after. Uh, very few of us will be alive in 2100 or 2200. These raise intergenerational issues of one generation paying for benefits that will be accrued by another generation. It raises ethical issues of intergenerational equity. It raises economic issues. For those of you who are economic majors, you've learned about discounting and there's a lively dispute about how you should discount costs and benefits and when you discount them, is it really worth doing anything? I'm not going to go into that. But this is a major challenge in terms of developing policy because you're asking voters today to do things for their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, and their great-great-grandchildren. Uh, there are also differences in effects across the globe. This is just one chart from the Stern Review uh, that looks at uh, changes in cereal production from a three-degree three uh, rise in warming in different, uh, uh, in different countries from different models. On, uh, on a global basis, it's a minus. But for a group of developed countries, it's a plus. For a group of developing countries, it's a big minus. How do you get them together to agree on a policy uh, when the problem is a benefit to some uh, and a cost to others? Well, let me now turn to the economics. How do, how do economists think about this problem? Well, it's, it's what's known as an externality problem, more commonly uh, among scientists, a commons problem. Uh, and an externality is an, occurs when an action by either a producer or a consumer affects other producers or consumers but is not reflected in market prices. That is, there could be a negative externality. You could do something that harms others uh, and, and creates damages, but you don't have to recognize the consequences because you don't pay for them. There can also be positive externalities. You keep your lawn nice and tidy. You paint your house every three years. Uh, uh, you don't put your old car in the backyard, things like that. That's a positive externality. It makes your, it makes your, your neighbors uh, uh, feel better. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions, emissions that destabilize climate are global negative uh, externalities. Uh, and they create a number of inefficiencies. Uh, uh, if these costs are not recognized in some way, uh, too much uh, energy will be produced. Uh, it will be produced in the wrong ways. Uh, the prices of output will be too low because it won't reflect the social costs of producing and using energy. And there'll be underinvestment in technologies uh, to mitigate CO2. If there's no payoff, there's no benefit uh, for doing it, uh, why would you bother spending the money except uh, because you're alt altruistic? Uh, it's also important to have at least a, a slight understanding of why do externality problems arise? Because they do arise all the time. And uh, they arise basically because there are missing markets. Uh, there are no markets for clean air, uh, in most cases for clean water. Uh, there certainly isn't a market for, uh, uh, for ozone uh, in the atmosphere or for, for CO2 concentration. So you can't rely on the market to fix the problem. Uh, there's no market because there are no property rights that are clearly defined and enforceable. Uh, and even if there were, the transactions costs of trying to uh, pin the tail on the coal plant donkey, uh, you did a bad thing, you're going to pay for it, uh, would be amazingly expensive. Uh, this is not to say there are some examples on the Connecticut River in Massachusetts, which, which was developed with hydroelectric resources uh, 100 years ago. Somehow the owners of the dams worked out a release schedule among them and have con contracts that do it rather than the government. But by and large, uh, it's very hard to uh, define property rights and enforce them in these cases. Uh, we don't get the right prices then. And externalities are a market failure, and they lead to a need for government action. So this, there is no free market solution. Uh, there is no voluntary solution. It requires uh, uh, government action. So how do we do it? How do we internalize these externalities? There are a number of different ways. Uh, they all should be evaluated from the perspective of trying to achieve these stabilization targets at the lowest possible cost. Uh, as I've already indicated, they're quite challenging uh, to even to get to 550. Uh, and we want to do it in a way that minimizes costs, taking uncertainties into account on both the climate side and the mitigation side, recognizing that there's a portfolio of options we're going to be relying on, some of which have attributes that are uncertain, and we want to stimulate innovation 
uh, and decentralized decisions to make effective use of information that is available uh, out there uh, in the world. So there are a number of different approaches. Uh, the economist's favorite approach, going back to an economist named Pigou, uh, is to place a price on, 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 the, on the source of the externality, in this case, greenhouse gas emissions. We could have emissions charges, so-called green taxes, uh, or almost equivalently, we can have a property rights-based system called the cap and trade system, uh, which uh, also puts a price on CO2 emissions. I'll explain how each of these work in a moment. Uh, there's a debate among economists about should it be prices or quantities, and I would say that's almost in-house baseball. The most important thing is both of these mechanisms put a price on CO2 emissions. There are other mechanisms that can be used. Uh, regulations, we can have emissions regulations. Uh, we can have subsidies for low carbon resources. We can have energy efficiency standards, and obviously we can subsidize R&D as the federal government has done. Uh, I agree with Nick Stern's conclusion that the primary mechanism should be uh, a price system uh, and that these other mechanisms should be viewed as uh, supplements to deal with other clearly defined market imperfections. Well, how does it work? Well, by placing a price on CO2 emissions, we make low carbon supply technologies more profitable uh, and high carbon technologies less profitable. We attract the rats who are going to smell the cheese. It's going to increase energy prices, and anyone who tells you it's not is lying. Uh, we want it to increase energy prices, uh, and that's going to make energy efficiency more profitable by reflecting the social costs of energy production and use. It will increase the attra financial attractiveness of R&D focused on uh, low-carbon technologies and energy efficiency, and it also efficiently uses diverse consumer and producer circumstances by stimulating decentralized self-interested decisions. They become self-interested because we placed a price uh, on CO2 emissions. Uh, the way an emissions tax system works is uh, uh, very straightforward. Uh, you have to measure the emissions. Uh, this would probably be done upstream at the power plant level and the refinery level and at the uh, gas pipeline level. Uh, a fee is placed on uh, the, the carbon content of the uh, fuel and producers have to pay uh, for their emissions. So th I think these are my only equations. Uh, if we go down here, uh, A is abatement, E is emissions. Uh, if there's no abatement, the firm would have to pay uh, PE, the price of emissions, times E. Uh, there's some cost of abatement. Uh, and now that we've placed a price on emissions, uh, there'll be some abatement. Uh, there'll be abatement up to the point where the cost of additional abatement is equal to the price uh, that's been placed on emissions. Uh, and this kind of decentralized scheme is very attractive because it uh, allows different firms to adapt to their own circumstances. So here are different firms that have, one has a low marginal cost of abatement curve, one has a low marginal cost of abatement curve, the one with the lower cost abates more, the one with the higher cost abates less. And this is quite different from the traditional mechanisms that have been used uh, by the EPA in the old days, which was to apply uniform standards on all sources regardless of their uh, of their uh, uh, abatement costs, and this is a much lower cost way of achieving, achieving any particular level of reduction. Uh, cap and trade systems work a little differently, but the result is the same. We set a cap at what we think is the optimal level of pollution. This can be a trajectory. Uh, we issue tradable pollution permits uh, to, uh, uh, to emitters. We could auction them off uh, and earn revenue for the government as we would with the tax. Uh, or we can allocate them in some other way. We can give them, give them away for free. Uh, we can give them to consumers uh, and have the consumers sell them to the, uh, to the oil companies and the, uh, and the coal companies. We then require all sources to match their emissions with a, uh, with a permit. Uh, this creates a demand for permits based on the, the costs of abating. So uh, uh, if the price of permits is high, firms will abate more the price is low, uh, they'll, buy, they'll buy permits. Permit trading will establish a price, just as with a tax, uh, and uh, we'll get the same type of behavior. So here, this is an example. This would be uh, the aggregate amount of permits issued, uh, and this would be the demand for permits based on the marginal abatement cost, uh, and the market would equilibrate uh, at P star. Uh, which is better, taxes or cap and trade? There's some technical economic issues here. There are also a lot of political issues. 
Uh, one question is, are we more confident about getting the price trajectory or the quantity trajectory right? Uh, based on the science, I like the quantity approach myself. Uh, what are the costs of getting the price or the quantity trajectories wrong? We're in a world with uncertainty, uh, and uh, one of the things that a tax system does is it fixes the price, but lets the quantity vary over time depending on how uh, abatement costs and demand are realized. Uh, whereas uh, the quantity approach allows the price and the cost to vary because it fixes the quantities uh, uh, while the, the, the costs of abatement are uncertain. Uh, there are domestic political considerations that have to be taken into account. Another way of saying this is we can't ignore those evil interest groups. Uh, they're going to have to be p they're going to have to be paid off in some way to get them to, to sign on to this uh, program. Uh, and here we have to make sure that the perfect is not the enemy of the good. Uh, one of the nice things about a cap and trade system is these permits are like currency. Uh, you can give some to the existing coal units. You can give some to the existing uh, oil producers. You can give some to consumers uh, to try to insulate them from some of the wealth effects uh, of, of this, of this uh, system while continuing to have a trading system so that they understand that the value of these permits is still uh, the market price. Uh, experience is an issue. Uh, we have uh, a lot of experience with cap and trade systems now in the U.S. We have no experience with a comprehensive uh, uh, green tax system. And then finally, international linkage considerations are important. Uh, we have, uh, 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 this is a global problem. Uh, we need to have mechanisms that allow us to link with the European Union, with Canada, with China, with India, uh, and there are good reasons to believe uh, that, a, at least from my perspective, that a pure tax system uh, is going to be difficult to link. The EU has already adopted a cap and trade system. Uh, many develop con developing countries do not have uh, well-developed, credible tax collection systems uh, and are, are going to find it very difficult to rely on a tax. Uh, and even Canada has developed a system that's, that's not based on charges but is based on uh, on caps. So uh, it may be that in in international linkage considerations uh, also play uh, in, the, in the minds of uh, uh, cap and trade advocates. Now there are hybrid systems that combine attributes of both. So this would be a cap and trade system would actually have a backstop or a safety valve which would allow permit prices to go only so high uh, to take into account some of the uncertainty about costs and then the government would begin to sell permits uh, at that price, effectively capping the price. In these hybrid systems to work, it's important that the, the safety valve be high, uh, not be low, not be an excuse for keeping the, uh, the CO2 price too low, and the safety valve can also be adjusted over time to reflect changing conditions. So let me now talk about a number of programs. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about the U.S.'s emissions trading program for uh, sulfur dioxide emissions. This is a cap and trade program that was created by the Clean Air Act amendments. Uh, of uh, 1990. Uh, it uh, was designed to control uh, SO2 emissions uh, by power plants that contribute to acid rain. Uh, the target was to reduce emissions by, uh, uh, by 50 percent. Uh, it was one of many uh, uh, cap and trade programs that we've now introduced in the U.S. And let me just show you some results from this program. The, the SO2 program was a two-phase program that affected the dirtiest coal units first and then all coal units uh, after 1995. Uh, this is business as usual. This is what would have happened without the regulations. Here's the actual cap. It's actually up here and down here. And the actual emissions are down here. And the reason you see this funny shape is, is this system had banking between the two periods. Uh, it allowed companies to reduce emissions a lot now in return for smoothing out their emissions paths in the future. Uh, we see the same phenomenon for the whole, uh, all power plants. This is business as usual. Uh, this is uh, actual emissions uh, uh, over time, uh, way below business as usual. Perhaps the proof of the pudding is in what happened to acidification. Uh, this is before, uh, this is after. Brown is bad, green is good, much less brown over here. This was a very successful program. Uh, it met its target uh, in, uh, uh, it, it met its reduction targets early with a cost saving that we estimated 50 percent. Uh, emissions prices also adapted to changing economic circumstances. 
Uh, up here, this is a period when natural gas prices rose dramatically. And the electric power sector led to a shift towards production of electricity with coal. Uh, this created an increased demand for allowances uh, in the short run. Uh, in the long run, more power plants put on scrubbers as the price of emissions allowances went, went very high. Scrubbers take sulfur dioxide out of the flue gas of the power plant, and the demand for allowances fell and has now fallen back to what it costs to scrub uh, the remaining coal plants without scrubbers. Uh, the European Union has adopted a carbon trading program uh, as part of its commitment to the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but there's much to learn from it. Uh, it doesn't cover all emissions. It covers power plants and some industrial sectors. It also has linkage mechanisms with uh, develop, developing countries and in phase two with developed countries. Uh, uh, each country has been assigned a target uh, emissions reduction. Uh, permits have been allocated and they're fully tradable uh, within the, within the uh, EU. Uh, it's a program that was designed and implemented very quickly uh, and has had some problems, but I think overall it's worked uh, uh, fairly, uh, fairly well. Uh, let me just note a, a couple of good things about it. First of all, we have to understand that phase one was really a trial period. Uh, the real action is going to be in phase two, the Kyoto commitment period. But even during the trial period, a robust liquid market for emissions permits emerged. Uh, prices varied widely through the period as economic circumstances changed, which is what we wanted. Uh, there's some evidence of short-term mitigation responses, although the ambitions of the program were very modest. Uh, but the program wasn't perfect. Uh, it was a very complex allocation system, uh, and it allowed for updating. Updating is a very bad thing to do. It's to allow firms in the next phase to get more permits if they emitted more. They made allowances available to new coal plants. That's a no-no. We shouldn't do that. They took the allowances away if plants closed. Uh, well, you really want all dirty plants to close, and you don't want them to stay open to keep their allowances. So under the SO2 program, if you close your plant, you get to keep the allowances, and that provides the right economic incentives to do so. Uh, the emissions accounting and trading system was not as transparent in the U.S., and it's quite clear that many policymakers in Europe did not understand the most fundamental principle of introductory microeconomics. It's called opportunity cost. If you give up someone something for free, it doesn't mean they're not going to include it in their prices. Uh, if somebody gives you a free acre of land uh, and you come to sell it three years ago, you're not going to give it away for free. Uh, you're going to charge the market price for it. So although 95% of the allowances were given away for free, uh, during the first year and a half of the program, uh, the price of allowances wasn't zero, it was pretty high, and it affected in particular the prices for, uh, for electricity. Here's some data on prices for, uh, in the EU ETS. Here are the prices for the trial period. Uh, they're now zero, the trial period's almost at an end. Here are the forward prices uh, for next year, for 2008, for the second period, which are about $30 a ton, they've been much more stable. There are some things to learn from the trial period. You see this big drop here. Uh, information was very hard to come by in the European system uh, about how, many, how much emissions there actually had been during the first year and a half. Uh, in April of 2006, the first report came out, and many, there were many fewer emissions than had been anticipated of CO2, which meant that there were more allowances available going forward to cover future CO2 emissions. The price dropped like a stone. Uh, 2006 was a relatively warm year. There wasn't a cold winter. Uh, and eventually, as we got towards the end of the trading period, uh, it was clear that there were going to be enough allowances to, to cover emissions uh, during the rest of the first trading period, uh, and uh, uh, prices have now fallen to zero. Uh, let me now talk about uh, going back to the U.S. Uh, what kind of prices would we need to hit a 550 stabilization target? Uh, here's a business as usual going out to 2100 forecast of, of energy production and electricity production uh, uh, from an MIT model, from the MIT joint program done by my colleagues. Uh, and under business as usual, I think the things that we, we still use a lot of coal, uh, we still use quite a bit of oil. Uh, we're now using uh, alternatives, oil shale and tar sands, which produce a lot of CO2. Uh, we're using a, a still some natural gas. Uh, we're using very little uh, renewables. 
Uh, and in the electricity sector, uh, we're using a lot of coal uh, and uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot of natural gas in this forecast. This isn't a forecast, I just want to show you what happens. What if we want to change this? Here is the emissions profile associated with that business as usual. Increasing emissions. Here is a, uh, a profile that seeks to stabilize global emissions at 550 parts per million. And here's the price trajectory on carbon prices that you need to make that happen. Uh, and I just want to say something about the price trajectory. It actually looks just like the price trajectory uh, that, that Dr. Hansen discussed this morning. The one thing I want to emphasize is this is a global tax or a global cap and trade system, a sort of an ideal system. But by 2050, the price is $200 a ton of carbon uh, or roughly $50 a ton of CO2. There are lots of politicians talking about $7 or $8 or $9. Uh, those prices are, uh, are too low. Uh, we're talking about really significant prices and, and, and bills that have much lower prices are not likely to, to work. And the effects of the price of the higher prices is to dr dramatically change the, uh, the, the, the nature of the uh, emissions that, uh, and energy use that we see. Uh, the scales here are different. Total energy consumption declines uh, rather dramatically under this scenario from over uh, 1,300 uh, to uh, uh, just, over, just around 900. But also the mix changes dramatically. We use coal, but we use carbon capture and sequestration in the model. This has both economic and potential political implications. Uh, from a political perspective, we think we need to do something for the coal miners or the railroads uh, or the coal miners' unions uh, or who knows who else. Uh, you can continue to use coal if you use carbon capture and sequestration. Uh, we also, in this scenario, get a lot more biomass, uh, primarily uh, in the transportation sector, uh, substituting for oil. So prices are what have an effect in changing the mix of energy resources uh, and in stabilizing uh, emissions. Let me conclude just with some brief remarks on where we stand in the U.S. Uh, with regard to federal greenhouse gas initiatives, a word on state actions. Uh, the U.S. actually signed the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, we just never ratified it. And we can, we can blame President Bush, I suppose, but President Clinton never submitted the treaty to, to the Senate for ratification either. Uh, and so nobody's ever had the courage to go to the Senate to, to have Kyoto ratified. The U.S. is not going to sign the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, it will be in, in a global system uh, beyond 2012, and the nature will be different. There are several states that have now proposed their own greenhouse gas initiatives. Uh, these will probably put more pressure on the federal government. Uh, the Supreme Court has now recognized that greenhouse gas emissions are a pollutant covered by the Clean Air Act, which has important legal implications. And I think most importantly, there are now several bills in Congress to develop a comprehensive national greenhouse gas mitigation program. And the attributes of those bills is they're built around cap and trade systems, uh, a small fraction of the allowances are initially auctioned off and the rest given away to buy off those special interest groups. But the auction fraction grows over time uh, uh, so that eventually the government is auctioning all of those allowances and the question then becomes what the government does with all the money. Uh, there are safety valve prices in them so prices can't go too high. There's banking and borrowing. This is very important. We don't really care if CO2 is admitted in 2014 or 2018. What we care about is the, is the total emissions. Uh, and banking and borrowing allows prices to be smoothed out. It allows corporations to plan for investments and is an important feature of these programs. Uh, these bills also have other programs that are bolted onto them. Renewable energy programs. There's a lot of money for demonstrations of carbon capture and sequestration. Uh, many economists are against these cap and trade bills. They have this dream that we'll have a tax and that all the money will come to the federal government and the federal government will then use the money to reduce other taxes, uh, bad taxes. Uh, it's nice to dream about that, but it's unlikely that that's going to happen. And I think those who are supporting a tax system and opposing a cap and trade system uh, may be committing the error of trying to support the perfect, but in the, in the end become the enemy of the good. Uh, Congressman Dingell from Michigan is supporting a tax system. 
Uh, why is he supporting a tax system? Uh, a man who has a history of protecting the automobile industry. He wants it to fail. Uh, and uh, a, tax, a tax system by all surveys is not nearly as popular among Americans as a cap and trade system combined with uh, the use of the money to promote energy efficiency uh, and renewable energy. Uh, I've overtaken my time. Let me uh, uh, skip some other interesting stuff and just go to my conclusions. Uh, uh, greenhouse gas stabilization at 550 parts per million requires significant global reductions in greenhouse gas emissions from business as usual levels by, by, by 2050. This is a big challenge. There aren't silver bullets. We have to keep that in mind. And the cost of mitigation isn't free. One of the worst things you can say is this won't cost anything. It's going to cost something. But the costs, if it's done right, can be, lower than the, can be much lower than the benefits. The costs are on the order of maybe 1 to 2 percent of GDP per year going forward. GDP is now about $14 trillion. Uh, 1 percent is about $150 billion a year. Uh, 2 percent is about $300 billion a year. Uh, just to put that in perspective, uh, this year we will send to oil exporting countries $350 billion uh, a year at the current price of oil. So it, it's not something the economy can't, uh, uh, can't sustain. Uh, the attributes of a least cost mitigation portfolio are uncertain. We have to keep that in mind. Placing a price on greenhouse gas emissions is the way to go, so the rat smells the cheese. Uh, and cap and trade is politically more attractive than taxes. And I would add, it's easier to link with the programs in other countries that either have been developed uh, or will be developed. Thank you. I could invite our panelists to come up and join us once again for Q&A. Send questions to the aisles. We'll pick them up and we'll begin in just a moment. We'll begin by asking our panelists if they have questions or reactions to Dr. Josko's talk. Anyone? Dr. Chu, you were wiggling your finger. I was wiggling my finger. I don't know why, but I'm in agreement with about 99.9% .9 of what he said. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, uh, Jim. Just a comment. Uh, yeah, I'm also in agreement with uh, essentially all of it. But, but rather than rats and cheese, maybe you, you'd have sugar and something else, because businessmen are not inherently bad. I mean, the country runs on, on business and profits, but uh, we need to have the incentives for them. And, uh, honey and bees or something? <laughs> <laughs> honey and bees. And, and, and also, it's not entirely good marketing if you want their corporate. <laughs> <laughs> right. Actually, actually, I, actually I, I got the term from the CEO of a large energy company who listened to a talk like this. He said, I get it. The rat needs to smell the cheese. <laughs> So, right. well, I, I thought the point about uh, policies that interface well with the rest of the world was, was a particularly excellent one. I mean, we uh, went back to the comment I made earlier that in, in my top three to things to do on climate would be to actually come to an international accord because I think when the world starts acting in consort on this, uh, we'll be in a very different position than we are today. And, I think it's an objective statement that uh, our country has been one of the largest impediments to the world acting in consort. So I thought that was a particularly, I hadn't thought about that. I thought that was a very important point. I said, had one comment as well on, uh, on incentivizing R&D in this whole area, which I think is really critical. It's been underfunded for a long time. And uh, I was glad to see at several points you brought that up as a, a complimentary thing to having, say, a cap and trade or, or some other kind of a carbon valuation system. Let me just add one slight remark because uh, uh, the session yesterday that mentioned BP reminded me. We talk a lot about government R&D and it's an important part, but to be able to mobilize uh, oil companies and coal companies and electric power companies to start doing R&D at a higher level and to refocus 
what they're spending it on is important as well. And if you give them these incentives rather than spending money on a new technique for horizontal drilling of oil, they may in fact do the kinds of things that BP has done at, uh, at, in the Berkeley area and uh, in London with Imperial College to, to focus on, on uh, biofuels because I think that's a company that sees that in a carbon constrained world as a potential business opportunity for them. I don't think they're doing it because they're nice. I, I think they're doing it because they, they think it makes sense from their perspective. I should also add, and this goes to your comment uh, in your talk, uh, BP is not only investing of scale, you know, half a billion plus dollars in research, they're actually investing of scale a billion dollars on a shorter time scale but, uh, in biofuels industry because they see biofuels as a new wellhead. And they said, we know biorefineries, or we know oil refineries, therefore we can understand biorefineries. So they really mean it uh, in, a, in a true business sense. It doesn't have to be just big companies. You know, a lot of the developments in agriculture in the U.S. Uh, occurred earlier in the 20th century at the local level with, uh, with some help from the Department of Agriculture and local people and farmers working together. And there's, there's no reason ideas only have to come from uh, big companies. They'll come from venture capital companies. They'll come from individuals. But they need to see there's something at the end of the tunnel for them. Mm -hmm. One more thing. Um, if uh, Jim Hansen, or Lind, or I asked for more R&D and research, it would sound like pigs feeding at the trough. If you ask for more, it's much better. <laughs> <laughs> Start, starting on January 1st, I'm going to be giving it out. <laughs> Sloan Foundation. Here's a question from the audience. How do these cap and trades affect underserved communities, the poor, lower middle class in the short term? Well, it, in the short term, if we, if we just, uh, let's just say we, whether we give them away for free or we auction them, they're going to lead to an increased price of energy. And since energy use is, uh, it, it's positively correlated with income, but uh, it's relatively uh, regressive, not quite as regressive as people think, but it's still, it's regressive. So it, it would harm uh, somewhat uh, lower income people. And one of the reasons I'm in favor of and all this, I'm one of the few people in favor of giving some of these allowances to individuals, uh, which they could then sell back to the oil companies or the coal companies, is to let them get some of the revenues that they might have gotten through a tax rebate system, but in the context of a cap and trade system. And the, actually, the McCain-Lieberman bill has a provision uh, that, that has some fraction going back to lower income people, underserved communities, and others which they can then sell for revenues to try to mitigate some of the effects on them of, of higher energy prices. The plans sound like they have potential, but how will they be enforced? The EPA already has enforcement issues. Won't this plan require an expansion of government? You know, the, the experience with both the SO2 trading program which has now been running for 12 years, and the, the NOx trading program in the Northeast, which has been running since 1999, is that these operate, at least for large facilities, very, very easily. They have con em continuous emission monitors on their stacks. Uh, they have uh, a requirement to submit the data uh, every month. Uh, there's a computerized registry where their emissions are registered, and they have until 30 days after the end of the year to uh, put basically it's a bank deposit uh, uh, emissions credits uh, uh, into their account to cover them or they pay a fine. Uh, and it's worked uh, very, very smoothly. It's, uh, uh, it, it's operated by very few people. Uh, it, it, it really uh, uh, hasn't been a major, uh, a major problem. For smaller facilities, the monitoring and the measurement of emissions would be more challenging. And the way you would do it would either be to just measure how much oil and gas is being delivered there uh, and, and impute a, uh, a carbon content to it, uh, or the trend is to try to move most of this upstream to the larger producers, to the power plants, oil refineries, and gas pipelines, and, and have them be responsible for uh, basically delivering energy that's already covered with, uh, with an emissions credit. 
uh, and we collect all those data already. Uh, uh, the Energy Information Administration collects them, and uh, they're pretty good. So I, I don't think that would be a major challenge either. Okay. I right, says, pure economics question. Is regulation generally the best way to deal with the commons problem? Well, the commons problem or the externality problem is we ought to try to internalize the externality. It just becomes a question of what mechanism you use. Uh, I, as well as most economists, would like to use a price-based mechanism because the source of the problem is a missing markets problem, uh, and uh, it, it uh, provides both the incentives to change your behavior to produce less of the externality, and it also leads to an increase in prices for the product to reflect its social costs. Uh, I think, in, in general, it's, it's going to be a better system. Uh, there may be circumstances where it's just too expensive to run such a system. This, the transactions cost may be, uh, may be very high, uh, and uh, you may want to rely more on, uh, on standards. But I, I think our experience with standards for large facilities, uh, large electric generating facilities, for example, has been pretty bad in that, in that they get delayed, they're not implemented, they're in court for years. We're still arguing about the new source review standards uh, 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 it's almost 30 years now since they were, uh, since they were passed. The, the, the thing about the SO2 program that was so impressive is once it went into operation, it just worked. Uh, no delays, it just worked like a, uh, like a charm. So I, I think it's pretty good. We just said, well, there may be other sources of market imperfection, though, that you want to deal with. So we know that consumers, for whatever reason, appear to behave quite myopically when it comes to decisions about energy efficiency investments in their homes uh, uh, and uh, how they choose their vehicles. So, so you may want to have supplementary regulations, uh, labeling regulations, efficiency standards, and so on to deal with other, uh, other real-world uh, decision-making issues that, uh, that arise. Dr. Chu? Uh, I'm not an economist, but let me let me say that um, there are certain externalities that I don't think would be, it'd be very difficult to couple. For example, if you're a chemical company, uh, one of the externalities of water pollution is higher medical costs of people downstream. Uh, it would be hard to put in the price of the plastics you sell that because the chemical company would work very hard to say this is not our fault or you can't put a real price on it. And so you get ended up, end up in this stalemate. Uh, you'd be amazed at where these ideas have been used in New Zealand. They use a, a, essentially a cap-and-trade system to allocate rights to fish. Uh, and the fish move, and it's, you'd think, gee, this wouldn't work at all, but it, it sort of works. Although I would say that um, uh, a cap-and-trade system is somewhere between a real incorporate into the externalities into the internal price naturally and a regular regulation. Again, I'm not a comments, but I, I... It's certainly a government intervention. Yes. It's heavy government intervention and yeah. somewhere in between there. He yeah. uh, says, you mentioned the price, prices like $50 per ton of CO2 emission. Could you translate that into the rate that would cost, or the rate that would be passed on to the consumer? Uh, how much would that raise the price of a kilowatt hour of electricity, for example? I have a chart here somewhere. Let me see if I can find it. It's one of those numbers I don't keep on the top of my head. Uh, well, what, how it affect electricity would depend very much on where you live because electricity is generated with different fuels. But the biggest effect would be on coal. It would raise the, if it's $50, would raise the price of utility coal by about 400%. So it would probably raise the price of electricity uh, in a, a Midwestern area by on the order of, uh, of 40 or 50 percent. Uh, it would raise the price of gasoline uh, by about 50 cents a gallon. So you can compare that. Gasoline is about $3 a gallon, so uh, it would be about, uh, about 20 percent. So the price effects are, are significant, but let me just point out, I, I didn't have time to go through some of the other modeling that my colleagues have done, but the price effects are quite important for meeting the, the mitigation target because that's what stimulates energy conservation. Uh, and 
these price effects are what get people to buy more efficient vehicles. It's what gets them to put in those compact fluorescents more quickly. Uh, it's what, get, what gets industry to uh, put in uh, uh, new technologies to, to monitor their and control their energy use in their, in their buildings. And you don't have to do it with price effects. You could do it with regulations and, and with building codes and so on. But uh, those have not proven to be all that effective in, uh, in many cases. So uh, I think the price side of this is, is, is important. And the, the, the message that one has to send to one senator or congressman in Washington is that we think this is important and we're willing to pay. Uh, if you say this is important, but we're not willing to pay anything, then the message they're going to get is keep that safety valve price at $7, and the result of that will be relatively little uh, uh, mitigation activity. Okay. Could, could I yes, comment on yeah. that? <clears throat> and I think it's important that the consumer recognize that there will be a a gradual change because when there's a sudden change in the price of gasoline you don't run out and get a new car but if you know 10 years from now it's going to be higher and significantly higher then you can make rational decisions that's why we need to decouple it as much as possible from political ups and downs so that each election it doesn't change uh, by a big amount that's why I think we need some sort of a a political uh, equivalent of the Federal Reserve Chairman to try to do what's best for the country. Uh, this is a this is a very important a very important point. Uh, in in the simulations we've done, we don't even put the price on until 2010 or 2012. We let people know what it's going to be, and then we publish a price trajectory. And it starts out low, and it rises over time. And most of the action is on with new investments. And one of the attributes, I mean, the energy system is, in, is a little like the climate. It, it responds slowly because there are a lot of long-lived investments. And what you want to do is make it clear that for new investments, you've got to factor into your analysis the fact that 5 or 10 or 20 years down the road, you're going to be paying substantial CO2 charges. That's why it's absolutely insane to have a program that gives new coal plants free allowances because it just ins gives them incentives to get built. Uh, even if down the road they decide not to produce very much, they can sell the allowances and pay back their capital costs. So I, I think this is a, a very important design issue that is both good economics and probably good politics. Okay. Well, I think at this point, perhaps we should call our session to a close. Thank you once again for a stimulating talk. <laughs>